Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks again for being here and those who are listening in. Uh, I've been keeping count on the first 100 days, so this is day 16 being governor, and this is the third COVID briefing as governor, so uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, again, thank you very much to uh, Dr. Alexander Scott and uh, Commerce Secretary Stephen Pryor, Executive Director, and, and Tom McCarthy, Executive Director of the of the state's COVID response. Uh, you'll be hearing from all of us today. A few notes. Uh, last week, I think very important, uh, President Biden set a goal of making every adult eligible to receive COVID-19 vaccine by May 1st. Uh, I want to say it again, that if Rhode Island can get the vaccine supply we need, we can achieve and beat this goal. And we are confident that the President will deliver. This is why our team is focused on increasing the state's vaccination capacity. Right now we have the capacity to administer 100,000 doses per week, and that's going to grow, and, and Tom McCarthy will outline how the growth is going to happen. Uh, this week we received 47,000 doses and had 62,000 appointments. But the good news is that we've received this week information from the federal government that uh, about increases in vaccine allocation uh, for all states, including Rhode Island. This information allows us to announce that on April 19th, Rhode Island plans to open up vaccination eligibility to all adults age 16 and over. A similar announcement was made yesterday in Massachusetts with a specific note about what people should expect in terms of booking an appointment. I think it's important that Rhode Islanders know that when we open up eligibility on the 19th, that does not mean everyone will receive a, a vaccination on the 20th. It'll likely take a few weeks for individuals to make to get their appointment, but we ask them to continue to do what everybody's doing right now, including my, my family. My wife, Susan, took two or three attempts, but within 10 days we were taking a vaccination, and next week I take my second a uh, vac vaccination uh, vaccine um, dose on March 23rd. Tom will walk us through the process of what, what our vaccination uh, supply numbers look like. Today, Dr. Ale Dr. Alexander Scott and I will be sending a letter to the White House requesting an additional allocation of 50,000 vaccines per week for Rhode Island to help us meet the President's goal of getting a first dose to every Rhode Islander by the end of May. I cannot stress enough, when the supply increases, Rhode Island must be prepared to hit the ground running. It's all about building the capacity, and that's our main goal and focus right now. We'll be building capacity up to as much as 150,000 shots a week. Next, I have, we have a few uh, announcements of Rhode Island's reopening. Uh, this is repetitive from last week, but it's good news that today, March 19th, we, we start enforcing and putting these, these, are, um, these conditions in place. So indoor dining, catered events, and houses of worship will increase to 75 percent. Retail gyms and persons, person care businesses will have an increase in their square footage restrictions. Office venues and assemblies and funeral homes can operate at 50 percent capacity. And finally, social gatherings can be up to 15 people indoors and 15 people outdoors. This incremental relief begins to put Rhode Island in line with our neighboring states. At the same time, I want to remind Rhode Islanders that we need to continue to be disciplined in the way that we follow the protocols so that our, so we can have a reopening that's safe and our reopening our schools that is safe as well. So having that discipline, and I was talking to a business owner earlier today, and you know they're, they're, they're getting anxious, and, uh, but we need to make sure that we deliver this message that this discipline at this moment in time is in all our best interest, and the quicker we are able to get uh, you know, to these vaccinations safely, the sooner we're going to be able to open up our businesses and open our schools. So let's continue the wearing the mask, let's continue the social distancing, wash your hands, and follow the guidelines and the protocols that we've have been put in place for months. We're all very familiar with that. So we also will be uh, making a, an effort to um, 
that Rhode Islands, as they become eligible, uh, they will be able to sign up for the shots, and, and we'll be talking about that in, in the next week and setting up a strategy where we can advance registration. But today, uh, the announcement is April 19th that all people are going to be eligible to uh, make an appointment. Final topic I is our planning around indoor, larger outdoor events for the summer. We want to provide some clarity and certainty. We know that outdoor events right now, they take several weeks to do the planning, and so we're trying to get ahead of the summer schedule by starting to open up uh, for business and organizations that are looking to host an outdoor event with more than 500 people. Uh, there'll be approval requests for such events. Uh, can be can be sent to the Department of Business Regulation for review. Uh, this is all done online through DBR website. Secretary Pryor will go into more details about if, the, if you're having hosting an event uh, this summer, uh, how to proceed so that we can walk your way through that safely. Give an example. We are we are working closely with the Newport Folk and Jazz Festival on a plan that could allow them to host a safe event this summer that involves testing and other safety protocols. But the good news, there'll be music in Newport this summer. It's not going to look exactly like the other festivals, but uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that it's a successful event. And we want to make sure that um, events like the Newport Jazz Festival uh, are in a position to continue their unbelievable work for the state of Rhode Island and the traditions that they, that they represent. I'll wrap up by um, the same way that I, uh, the last few weeks, by highlighting to, uh, to all those who are watching uh, our team's approach to vaccination. It's all about getting vaccines out of inventory and into arms, increasing capacity so when vaccine supplies increases, we are prepared, supporting our communities as we merge municipal vaccine sites into strategic regional sites. And Tom will talk more about that when he, when he makes his comments. We're going to be opening additional state sites as well and working on a strategy to combat a vaccine hesitancy in our communities, which we're going to be really emphasizing considerably over the next few weeks in terms of making people know that they're safe and it also keeps them uh, from getting into the hospital. And we, we don't want any more families that have to suffer through what other families have suffered through over the last 10 months in terms of any, any, any level of death. Right? That's something we don't want to see. And that's why I continue to reinforce the importance for discipline right now in the way that we're doing things. And we'll be incrementally um, creating incremental flexibility as quickly as we can, as you can see that we're, we're rolling it out now. So that, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nicole Alexander-Scott to walk us through some of the details that are important on the health, health front. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate that. Good afternoon, everyone. So, as I often do, we'll get started with an overview of our COVID-19 numbers. Our data appear to be to have plateaued. So that's important to note. We were in a very sharp decline for several weeks. Our numbers are stable, but not decreasing as sharply as they were previously. Our percent positivity for over the last week has held steady at around 2%. Our number of new cases per week has essentially remained flat as well, but we did see a slight increase in the week over week numbers of our new hospital admissions. That number went from 118 to 135. The case rates in our cities and towns continue to trend down overall. However, we have seen some increases in some communities that we are paying very close attention to. Those communities include uh, Cranston, Cumberland, Woonsocket, South Kingston, and Narragansett. We're continuing to watch those situations very closely because they also may be a sign of what we want to be prepared for and stay in front of in terms of what's possible with the whole state. We're also watching our COVID-19 variant situation very closely. It's important to really spend a few minutes on this so we understand um, 
that we're not fully out of the woods yet, uh, but we do have a strong path. People just need to be aware of the importance for staying vigilant. We are seeing more and more cases of the B117 variant here in Rhode Island. This B117 variant is often called the UK variant. It is known to be much more contagious than the uh, standard variant of COVID-19 that we have dealt with. And that's why it's important to pay close attention to it. Through our Dr. Eva King and our team at Rido's State Health Laboratories, we are coordinating a sequencing surveillance program in partnership with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and our colleagues here in the state that are internationally uh, known for their work uh, related to these types of efforts. When we sequence a specimen, we are decoding the viral genome, the DNA of the virus, so to speak. And we're comparing the genetic code to the original strain of the virus to be able to understand when there is that difference. As I just described, and as you can imagine, this is a very complex process. So we don't do it on every single specimen, but we do it on randomly selected specimens to really help us understand what strains are circulating in the community and what proportion of our population is impacted by it so that we can continue to push that message of being vigilant. We don't want to get too comfortable yet until we are really fully um, uh, moving forward in accomplishing the steps that we have in mind. So far, we have sequenced 653 Rhode Island samples. Of important note, in this most recent group of 85 specimens that were sequenced, 12 were the more contagious B117 variant. That's an example of how we need to be more mindful. We're very excited to be making a lot of progress on our vaccination campaign. That's what we balance um, our concerns with the variant up against, as well as the testing and treatment that we know is important. We all understand how critical it is for our business community and for all of us that we're able to make some of the restriction adjustments that the governor referenced we talked about last week and that is planned for activating tomorrow. However, right now we estimate that less than 30% of Rhode Islanders are immune to COVID-19 at this point, either because they have been fully vaccinated or because they have had previous infection. Now that is very quickly changing as we are um, administering vaccine at the very high accelerated rate that we are, but it's an important context for all of us to understand that there are still a lot of people who are out there who are susceptible. And it allows me to remind that we continue to have tools at our ready to help us to combat that. We've known that and we want to continue forward. Mask wearing remains critical, even more so now than ever. It's the place that I keep bringing us back to because of how effective mask wearing is. We all have a little COVID fatigue right now that's fully understood and appreciated. Um, but the more we can encourage each other, remind our loved ones, protect our household, the better we can do because we need to keep wearing our masks. It's still the rule in Rhode Island whenever you're with people who are outside of your household. Whenever you're with people you don't live with, please make sure that you are wearing your mask. And make sure that you're wearing a high quality mask. That's even more effective now that we know that the variant is here and continuing to spread at a faster rate uh, than uh, the previous versions of coronavirus. Wear a high quality mask and wear it correctly. Your mask 
should fit snugly but comfortably over your nose, mouth, and chin without any gaps. KN95, like the one I have, are very good masks to have, but you can also use a cloth mask that is at least two layers thick. For more information so that you can have what you need to protect yourself and protect your household, go to covid.ri.gov and click on COVID-19 prevention. On top of masking, which is one of our best tools, we know the three things that I always stress, which continue to be testing, treatment, and vaccinations. We continue to lead the nation in testing. The capacity is there. Please continue to take advantage of it. Get tested regularly. Get tested every week. Easter is coming up, among other days, as well as the spring. If you plan to see anyone from outside your household, get tested every week and then get tested also on the days that lead up to the particular holiday or the particular event where you're going to get together with loved ones within that um, our um, social distancing guidelines. Uh, but use the resources that we have to stay safe. Our testing is fast, it's easy, and it's free. Go to portal.ri.gov to make an appointment for a same day test. On the treatment front, I want to remind you again that we have treatment in Rhode Island. It is critical, it is very effective, it's keeping people out of the hospital, it's doing exactly what we need it to do, but we need you to access it, to know about it, to work with your provider or work with a provider, even if you don't have one. If you test positive, talk to a doctor about treatment, especially if you are older than 65 or you have an underlying health condition. Treatment is available whether you have coverage for it or not. It is there for you whether you have a doctor or not. We have doctors that can be available to get you connected to the treatment. It saves lives. We wanna make sure everyone who qualifies accesses treatment. Go to covid.ri.gov backslash treatment or call our info line. Finally, on vaccination, we continue to vaccinate at a very strong pace. 136,513 people in Rhode Island are fully vaccinated. That means that for the first time, we can say that more people are fully vaccinated against COVID-19 than we have in Rhode Island that have been infected with COVID-19. I think we should all take a moment to reflect on how important that is. 12% of Rhode Island is fully vaccinated, which puts us at the national average, and we are in the top five nationally for first doses administered. That's on par with Connecticut, and that's a few slots ahead of Massachusetts. If you think about how effectively we have vaccinated, both from our phase one strategy and into phase two, within this relatively short period of time so that we have more people fully vaccinated in Rhode Island than all of the months it took to have the number of people actually infected with COVID, it's encouragement for showing we are on the right path. As vaccines come in here in Rhode Island, we're making sure that they are getting administered. A major project for us right now is building out our capacity because we are getting forecasts about a lot more vaccine coming into Rhode Island over the coming weeks, as the governor shared. It's even over the last 24 plus hours that we've received some of those additional updates from our federal partners. And there's been a lot of talk about President Biden's charge to states to open eligibility to all adults by May 1st. And it's great that uh, Tom is joining us so that as the executive director focused on operations and really pushing our team forward, you can have the same confidence that we do as you hear some of those really uh, logistical details that we have laid out. 
on our ability in Rhode Island, given our infrastructure and capacity to be able to surpass that May 1st goal. Based on the projections we're getting from the federal government and what we have already built out, we actually believe that we can open eligibility to the last age cohort on our timeline, which is people 16 to 39 by the week of April 19th, as the governor has shared. We'll be back with the specific dates of how we'll speed up those who are older so that by April 19th, all those 16 plus will be eligible. To be clear, as the governor mentioned, we want to um, make known that not everyone will be able to get an appointment by April 19th, but we do, um, we are prepared to make eligibility open for everyone and so that appointments can start booking at that point for those 16 plus and be available for um, the subsequent uh, two weeks or so building out from there. But by that time, we will want to have vaccinated a large proportion of all those older than 40 years of age. So stay tuned with us on how we will help make that available. I wanted to reiterate what the governor has stated about April 19th, just to help people understand that we are getting close. And as you'll hear further details from Tom, to understand the confidence in the team and the tremendous work, even from earlier this week and over the last 24 hours to now, to be able to respond to what we're getting and move quickly to uh, make vaccine available. We recognize that there is a lot of angst and frustration out there. We understand why it's good in a sense that people are eager to get vaccinated. We want that to continue so that we can get vaccines into the arms of everyone who wants one and needs one. We are almost there. Our focus on having a great summer here in Rhode Island is right at our fingertips. In a matter of weeks, every Rhode Islander will be eligible to make an appointment for a first dose of COVID-19. As I stated last week, we are asking you, continue to hang in there. Be patient with us. It is just a little while longer, and we will make sure that, we're get, that we get there. We're ready, and, and we are able to get vaccines into the arms when the vaccine arrives here. Uh, in Rhode Island. The last note I want to make on our vaccination campaign is that we have been working closely with municipal leadership, with our COVID-19 Equity Council, with our Health Equity Zones, and many other partners over the last few weeks to move forward on the strategies to narrow the gaps we have and are seeing in our COVID-19 vaccination rates particularly in those communities that have been harder hit. We have work to do, and we know that access and equity are major focus areas for us to advance on. We will get to that point. We won't give up in continuing to narrow the disparities that exists between those who are hospitalized and those who have access uh, to vaccines. And with the governor's leadership, we will continue to advance our high density community vaccination strategy to help close that gaps. I wanted to make clear to people that this is a priority for us and we're putting it front and center and focusing on implementation in helping to make it happen. And with that, I'll pass it on to Tom. Good afternoon, and thank you, Governor and Director, for the uh, updates. I'm going to provide a quick overview of where things stand operationally. Uh, with regards to our vaccine campaign. As most people probably know, we opened eligibility last week to people 
60 to 64, and people 16 and 64 with specific underlying health conditions. This was great news because this meant that we'd vaccinated in excess of 80% of Rhode Islanders that are 65 plus. It also meant we had a strong start and we'll be able to continue to vaccinate at a high rate in the state. However, we're very aware that since we've opened up eligibility, this was 150,000 Rhode Islanders that were newly eligible and the demand far outpaced supply. This wasn't something unexpected and we appreciate everyone's patience, but any day that we opened eligibility to these groups, especially at this stage in the vaccination campaign, we would have far outpaced the supply that we've received from the federal government. So with that, we're continuing to improve our scheduling experience with more information to follow in the coming weeks. But the good news is that as Dr. Alexander Scott said, supply increases are on the way. Another piece of good news is that more first dose appointments will become available because of the natural rhythm of our statewide vaccination effort. There are weeks when a large portion of our vaccine needs to go towards people's second doses because three or four weeks prior, we'd had a large surge in first doses for vaccinations. This is the case now in the middle of February as Rhode Island shifted to phase two of the vaccine effort and significantly increased the rate of vaccinations, first doses soared. But that means that at the end of last week and through this week, we have less of our vaccine available to start new people with their first doses. We're posting new slots regularly on vaccinateri.org on Tuesdays and Fridays, but we're happy to announce that we have an additional 1,500 slots that are going to be made available today in addition. This reflects how responsive our vaccine effort has been able to be as we rapidly manage and dynamically reallocate doses as they become available throughout the state. We saw a great response from our teachers, school staff, and child care workers, and a tremendous partnership from our retail pharmacies and municipal clinics dedicated to the effort. A large number of our school staff, teachers, and child care workers were able to be vaccinated through our retail pharmacies, which freed up some additional doses from our dedicated municipal clinics that we could then redistribute to other eligible groups. Tomorrow at our normal 5 p.m. time, will release another 3,250 new first dose appointments. I wanna take a moment now to give people a sense of how much vaccine is coming into Rhode Island and how much is getting administered. 55,082 doses were administered in Rhode Island last week. That number is for both first and second doses. The amount of vaccine we're receiving in Rhode Island is still around 47,000 doses per week. This week, we received 47,600 doses of vaccine. That, that, that vaccine usually comes in on Mondays and Tuesdays each week, as you see our administration rates fluctuate. We expect to administer 62,700 doses of vaccine this week. You'll notice that we're administrating, administering more vaccine this week than we are receiving. That's because most of the vaccine that we administer this week arrived in Rhode Island last week. In that same way, most of the vaccine that arrives in Rhode Island this week will be administered next week. Looking forward, we anticipate receiving 50,980 doses of vaccine next week. We're expecting steady increases in our allotments of Pfizer and Moderna vaccine and are expecting large increases from Johnson & Johnson all very good news. Currently, Johnson & Johnson is producing roughly 500,000 doses a week right now for the entire country. That is expected to increase to between five and eight million doses a week. What that means for Rhode Island is about 16,000 doses a week of Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be available by the end of the month. Compared to the roughly 1,500 we are getting now, and that 16,000 figure is slated to continue increasing. Because we expect so much more vaccine, we've continued to work hard to build out our capacity. Currently, today, we have the ability to administer 100,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine a week. 
we're planning and anticipate to be able to push that number up to 160,000 doses per week by the end of the month, pending allocations. Because of the supply increases coming to Rhode Island and because of the infrastructure expansions we've made, we have high confidence in that April 19th date that Dr. Alexander Scott shared. On the infrastructure side, we have two more large state-run vaccination sites planned, one in Woonsocket and one in South County. And both of those locations will be prepared to open by the end of the month, again, just waiting on additional allocations of vaccine. We're also planning to integrate three additional vaccination sites supported by cities and towns open to all Rhode Islanders, just like our larger mass vaccination sites. We envision these opening in the southwestern part of the state in Westerly, in the northeastern part of the state in East Providence, and at a third site in northwestern Rhode Island that the team is continuing to plan the location for. You'll be able to register for these sites in the same way that people register for the other mass va vaccination sites through vaccinateri.org. These sites will be open when we have enough vaccine coming in Rhode Island, hopefully in the coming weeks. As all this planning is happening, new vaccinators are also coming on board. Stop and Shop and Walmart both have pharmacies and both will be vaccinating at select locations in Rhode Island, just as CVS and Walgreens. When eligible, you'll be able to go on the websites for Stop and Shop and Walmart to make appointments. The last thing I want to update on today is vaccinating for homebound Rhode Islanders. Some health agencies and other vaccinators have started to vaccinate their homebound clients and residents. However, as Dr. Alexander Scott has outlined, we set up a partnership with three agencies to administer COVID-19 vaccine to homebound people in their residences. Those agencies are Alert Ambulance, MedTech Ambulance, and PACE. We worked hard to collect information about people who cannot get out of their homes to get vaccinated. We developed an online form. We'll continue to engage with our communities and our stakeholders here and partner with the Office of Healthy Aging, Health Insurers, Senior Centers, Healthcare Providers, and others to collect this information. The people we have information for currently will be contacted to schedule appointments, and these three agencies will start administering shots as early as tomorrow. Though many people may not have appointments scheduled for a few more days. So this is great news, as Dr. Alexander Scott said. Access and equity are two key pillars for this vaccination effort, and we're very excited to be reaching these critical populations. With that, I'll pass to Secretary Pryor. Good afternoon. Thank you, Tom. Uh, well, you've heard about the stability in our public health conditions uh, from Governor McKee and Dr. Alexander Scott, and you've heard about the progress on our vaccinations from Tom. We're pleased that the combination of this stability in our public health data and this terrific progress on vaccinations enables us to continue to reopen the Rhode Island economy. Uh, it's enormously important that we stay on track with our plans for reopening and I'm pleased to report that Governor McKee's articulated plan for, uh, for tomorrow for the reopening of a number of businesses at higher capacity levels, that it is, it is indeed on track. You've heard from the governor today, uh, but the, uh, the businesses that will be able to reach the 75% capacity level, uh, which includes restaurants, catered events, and houses of worship, um, those institutions will be able to proceed with those plans. Um, and the 50% level for offices, funeral homes, and venues of assembly, that too is on track. So um, the chart that we displayed last week is in effect starting to tomorrow, uh, and we're very pleased that businesses will be able to expand their capacity and do more business. It's enormously important that these incremental changes occur uh, because it enables our businesses to survive and indeed begin to thrive um, coming out of these pandemic conditions. We have a lot more work to do, but we're very, very pleased to see it. Um, continuing this reopening process, 
Staying on track requires that we all do our part. So it's, it's very important that we continue to wear our masks, to keep our distance, to seek vaccinations when we're eligible, to go and get testing. These are the things that will enable us to continue to, reopening into the, to, to reopen into the future. Um, so I want to elaborate upon the point regarding venues of assembly. Uh, we addressed last week and beginning this week, uh, venues of assembly uh, will be able to reach 50% capacity uh, and open up for 250 people indoors and 500 people outdoors. Venues of assembly include auditorium, uh, auditorium forums, auditorium venues, uh, theaters, performing arts centers. Venues of assembly also include uh, outdoor events, uh, structured events, formatted events where large numbers of people gather. So I want to hone in on the point about 500 people outdoors in this category of venues of assembly. Uh, we've received inquiries regarding events that are still larger. Uh, you heard Governor McKee refer to the Newport Folk and Jazz Festivals. We're pleased to be collaborating closely with these festivals to enable them uh, to announce plans in the future. Uh, we're very grateful to Director Janet Coit of DEM and uh, Dr. Alexander Scott and their teams for helping to formulate these plans into dialogue and to Director Liz Tanner of the Department of Business Regulation very much as well. Um, so we have been receiving inquiries about doing events still larger than 500. Um, we have been encouraging Rhode Islanders throughout the pandemic to take it outside. Um, it is safer to conduct business and to do events outdoors. Um, so we want to provide the way, and as Governor McKee has said, we want to provide predictability where we can. So the big takeaway for today is that starting May 1st, events that seek approval for up to 1,000 participants may contact the Department of Bus Business Regulation, and they, in tandem with RIDO, the Department of Health, uh, will review and approve proposals where the capacity in the given venue does not exceed 10%. So if there are event planners, event promoters, event organizers who are seeking to do events bigger than 500, uh, they may approach the Department of Bus Business Regulation for events that begin May 1st. They may approach DBR starting now uh, and may seek approval for those events up to 1,000 people, up to 10% of seated capacity, or if your event is not as structured and is not a seated event per se, uh, there will be other health protocols and standards that are applied for the purposes of approval. Uh, now, um, DBR may introduce elements such as testing um, and may require specific portions of the plan regarding pinch points like entrances and exits, markings on the ground. Those are the kinds of things that will be discussed with an event applicant. Uh, so please, again, uh, contact DBR, and I'll say more about uh, how to do so. Um, so that's the big takeaway for now. Uh, we recognize that there are events that are enormously important, that are even larger, uh, that will want to exceed 1,000, uh, and that want to look deeper into the summer and indeed into the fall and understand what the possibilities are. So we want to begin inventorying those events, um, so the governor and we can review that inventory and we can begin dialogue with these event organizers uh, so that they, uh, they can receive approvals. Uh, we are especially focused on events that are aiming for uh, the time period after July 15th. Um, beginning in mid-July, um, if events wish to be larger than 1,000 attendees, DBR will begin to make approvals for those events with the aforementioned conditions in consultation with the Department of Health. So May 1st forward, up to 1,000 apply to DBR. July 15th and thereafter, over 1,000 apply to DBR. In that inter, inter, uh, interim period, we're going to be inventorying the events we cannot yet say the precise levels that uh, will be judged safe and the precise protocols that will be in place, but that inventory will let us go about the work of dialoguing with these events um, and getting the job done. 
helping to provide guidance, helping them conduct planning, um, and, uh, and over time, providing for approvals. We'll provide additional updates on our large event guidance at this forum and via the reopeningri.com website over the coming weeks and months. If an event organizer wishes to apply to the Department of Business Regulation for May 1st forward for 500 to 1,000 attendees or for July 15th forward for over 1,000 attendees, uh, please seek the website www.dbr.ri.gov. If you wish to just become part of the inventory and let us know that, we sh that you want to dialogue with us for that interim period, please do the same and contact DBR. We're very pleased that we're looking to the future at this point in time and that uh, the future looks bright. Uh, we expect that during the summer, larger events uh, and ever larger over time can begin to happen in Rhode Island. We're, we're renowned for some of our events. Uh, it's part of life in Rhode Island. It makes for a phenomenal summer. It makes for a phenomenal fall. And we're grateful to Governor McKee for providing the leadership that we can begin to make these approvals. With that, we will open it up for questions. McCarthy. Director McCarthy, what are your you painted, you painted an optimistic work? picture for the future for vaccinations. The reality for the president is you sent tens of thousands of people on a fool's errand this past couple of weeks, this past week specifically, because you opened it up for 160,000 people with 1,800 doses. You had two and a half million views on your page, and that engenders frustration. So can you give me the thought process? It's nice to say, hey, we're going to get it done by April 19th because we got all this coming in. Why in the world would you open up that tranche of people when you knew you only had X number, a very small percentage of first dose. What's the mindset? Yeah, I think the big thing for us is to continue to sustain, you know, that nation leading rate of administration. At that point, we'd vaccinated and scheduled above 80% of everyone that had already been eligible in Rhode Island. And we had doses that were ready to go into arms and fully recognize that it's frustrating, frustrating, you know, when demand far outpaces supply. But we have 5,000 first doses to get into arms this week in state sites. Why did you wait a week when you got more in? It's still, the numbers don't add up. Because each day is critical. Waiting one week, that has a significant public health impact. So for us, it's getting a shot into an arm as quickly as we can. But with that, with that, we're committed to continuing to improve the experience. And we'll have some more info on that in the coming weeks. So we acknowledge that we, and we're committed to continuing to make that a better overall scheduling experience. But the best thing from a public health perspective and for the state of Rhode Island is to get shots in the arms as quick as we possibly can. can go over the numbers of, so 160,000 people come on board. When you open up that next group or whatever that group is, so what are those numbers? When you get to April, so how many people are available now? How many people have been vaccinated? When that next tranche opens up, is it another 50,000? It is another 200,000? What are the numbers that we're looking at? Yeah, we're working on the detail that gets us from now to April 19th, learning on the experiences to date, and then continuing to roll out technology supports that are going to help make that scheduling experience better. So we'll have more details on that next week. About, about the homebound people, I have a woman who has 94-year-old parents who contacted me. She said three weeks ago she contacted the health department, she got a survey monkey survey, has heard nothing. So for her right now, you mentioned three companies. What does she and others who have homebound relatives, who can they contact today? Yeah, we have uh, information on our website, the ADO. Okay. What, what could she, who could she call? What's the contact right now? Jim, I'll get you. Yep. Governor, let's just say this isn't going to happen what are your, with the uh, next group, and how much of this is political pressure just to open up, you know, Connecticut and Massachusetts announced the accelerated uh, eligibility by mid-April as well. How much of this is political pressure, even though you acknowledge the appointments may not be there to actually do it? I don't think it's political pressure. We're, we're saying to people we need to make sure they get vaccinated. We know that there's a, a more demand than there is supply. 
We've just mentioned that we're going to be able to do as much as 160,000 shots in a week. We're going to keep the pressure on D.C. to get us the supply, and we're going to build it out. Now, as far as that Friday, that was a, a two-hour, three-hour type time frame, and I've talked to people who were frustrated that actually got appointments. So we're encouraging people to continue to try to get appointments. We understand that there's not enough supply to cover the demand, but we got to make sure that we get every shot in the arm that we possibly can. Governor McKinney. Uh, what are your administration's public health benchmarks that, when, when met, will result in the suspension of the state emergency order, restore civil liberties, and end the arbitrary and capricious shutdowns that have destroyed the private economy here in Rhode Island? Yeah, so I, I mentioned that last week. I, I think that we don't have a firm vaccination number, but it's in that range of 70 percent, one shot. Respectfully, Governor, that's not the question. The question is, what are the benchmarks? When, it doesn't require a I just told you, 70 percent of the shots in the arms of the people in Rhode Island. I'm looking forward to, re, you know, eliminating this executive order in terms of the emergency order and to get, you know, working with the General Assembly in a way that uh, we traditionally have. So 70 percent, if you were going to need 70 percent, I'd like to finish, please. If you, what you are saying, for the record, is that when we receive and attain a 70 percent vaccination rate, the then reason. you will end the civil order that has shut down Rhode Island. Well, first of all, there was a reason to uh, have the emergency status that we've had. People are getting infected there. We have families that are dying. God bless them all. So the notion that somehow that what we did was an over overreach is not, I, I don't accept that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Final, final, please, one, one more question. Just if, in fact, you're talking about full vaccination by April or May, then why is it Stephen Pryor discussing limiting the opening of the true economy to July, August? September, whenever. The, the idea is that we're going to have a sh one shot in everybody's arm by the end of May, just like the President said, but I've got confidence that those supplies are coming. Uh, and we're opening up the planning stages because I don't know if you've ever done an event. I have. It takes several weeks to do that, several months to do that. We're opening it now so that we're up and ready to go when, when the time comes that we can open up for the summer. So I think we're, 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 we're looking at that and we're opening up the process in a way that is advancing thinking months down the line to make sure that these things happen. I'm sure people could plan right now. Quick, so frankly, we'll go Alexa and then Can I? Dr. Alexander Scott, Director McCarthy, this question is both for you. I would like to address the homebound issue. Not every homebound senior has access to a computer. They're not all served by a home health agency. How are we making sure that we're not leaving anybody behind? Yeah, it's an, an important um, focus that we have. Uh, the link that had been shared previously was so we could have the list of everyone who is homebound and be ready to reach out to them. We have also shared that you could call our information line, understanding that not everyone has access to the internet, 222-8022. Call us, let us know that you or a family member or a loved one or a friend you know is homebound. And we have now finalized the process to have the companies that are preparing to go out and deliver those. We've said over the last few weeks that it should be uh, happening within this coming week, and that's what our uh, intention is to do. And then just to follow up to that as well, um, the health department, you guys are developing a waiting room to schedule a vaccine. When is that coming out? What's it going to look like? And why did it take so long to come out? Uh, we'll be providing some more details on that. We want to make sure that it is solid and in place and ready in advance of us opening eligibility uh, further. Um, and, you know, to the points mentioned earlier, as soon as we have any vaccine available, no matter how small the amount, our focus is to get it into the arms of individuals who are out there. So once we were starting to run short on finding those individuals in the previous eligibility group, we wanted to make sure that we opened. When we have more vaccine, it would only be a couple thousand additional to still cover 150,000 people. So there's never any perfect time to do that where it's not going to be frustrating. I did say last week, please be patient with us. As we continue to get more vaccine, we will get it into more arms and we will have that additional registration um, support service to uh, improve the user experience, which is the goal as well. Will they be notified um, when a dose is available to them once they enter into this waiting room? How will it eliminate the frustration? 
We'll be back with some more of those details. I'll welcome Tom to add anything. But our plan is to have that all mapped out and clearly shared well in, ad in advance of that being available. Governor, I noticed that your proposed budget fully funds the ride up multi-hub bus plan that will clear out most of the buses in Kennedy Plaza despite the opposition of the Providence City Council, neighborhood groups, racial justice, and public transportation advocates. In fact, the only group I can find in favor of the plan besides DOT are rich downtown building owners who want to clear out the homeless and working class people of color from Kennedy Plaza. The plan has been called racist. It's the subject of a Title VI lawsuit. Seems to misappropriate funds from a 2014 bond referendum and was done with virtually no public input over the objections of riders. So I'm wondering, why are you supporting this plan? $35 million is on the line to help improve transportation in Providence, and we're going to use it. And uh, I'm sure that the final plans will speak to the issues that you just talked about. Right here. Yes, but uh, Rider has refused to actually Please. have any kind of just public interaction the with the riders or anybody God. else who's been raising these objections um, for a long period of time, actually. You know, I'm going on two years. You have to follow up on that. We, you know, keep this to the COVID. And, and I can tell you that people who are affected by this plan are, in fact, the people who are most affected right. by so COVID. I'll get, I answer it again. This $35 million has been appropriated to help transportation in the city of Providence, and, and, and the smart thing to do is find a good way to use it, and that's the intention, and that's why it was in the budget. But the $35 million isn't really being done to improve it, it's being done to dismantle it, and it's not being done to, I mean, $35 million can be spent either way, it can be spent for good or bad reasons. No one's objecting to the spending of money on public transportation, they're objecting to the way it's being spent to the adverse effect of uh, Kennedy Plaza to the bus riders. I'm just going to answer it the same way. $35 million invested in Providence right now is a good investment, especially coming out of the pandemic when we lost 70 percent of the income and, and to the businesses in downtown. So hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people a day will be affected by this, adding 20 minutes, maybe an hour to their um, commute. I'm confident that I'm confident that it'll be a good plan and we're going to invest those dollars to improve the transportation in Providence. Uh, you mentioned you're looking forward to the day you can end the emergency uh, authority here in the state. When do you have a date on that? Do you have a date that you're looking at? And who calls that to an end? Is that you or would that be the General Assembly? Well, we're work I'm going to be working with the General Assembly. I, th I think it, it, is a, it is the governor's um, you know, charge right now on those executive orders. And we are looking forward to that time frame when uh, you know, that there's not an executive order or an emergency in place. So, um, but it's going to be subject to the vaccination rate and the people who are, you know, so we get into a spot where, where we know that people are not at risk. Uh, as soon as they're not at risk, we're going to remove the emergency order and we're going to work with the General Assembly in conjunction with that. What's that vaccine rate look like? I think it's going to be in that range of 70 percent, one shot, at least one shot to 70 percent of the people. And again, the president has said we're going to have the volume to get that done by the end of May, and you just heard um, from from Tom that uh, we're 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 gearing up on the. Um, and I want to emphasize this to the people who are watching right now: we are building capacity in a way. And, and Dr. Alexander Scott said that you know we've gone from 50th or whatever it was to top five. We're going to make sure that we're maintaining that level of vaccination so that we can be, get to that point as quickly as the vaccines are made available. Out of, out of Washington. So 70% top five, that, what, what, do you have the numbers on how close we are to that 70% threshold, doctor? We're modeling out the, that, and I've asked that to be made in terms with Tom, and to, it, we'll have that answer for you next week. But we want to see where the, we, wa we do want to answer that kind of a, a not a, a, an absolute date, but we do want to have a range, and we want to back off of that date so that we actually keep in pace with that date because that's the goal right the goal is to do exactly what has been asked in a couple of questions here is to get off the emergency uh situation and getting back into where we're opening our schools and we're um op reopening our businesses in a way that makes sense and and finally you know making sure that uh, we're, we're we're being fair with everybody out there as dr alexander scott said in terms of how people have been impacted by this crisis yeah, and then Paul. Mr. McCarthy, I have, two, I have two questions. First, the mass vaccination sites. Uh, we heard from the Woonsocket mayor that that might not be opened at the end of the month, like the state is saying. Second, so what are the plans there? And secondly, where exactly in South County? People want to know where it's going to be because they don't want to make the drive all the way to, to Cranston. So where is that going to be as well? Sure. So for the Woonsocket site, the site itself will be ready by the end of next week. And the only thing that we're waiting on in order to open the doors and turn the lights on is 
the number of doses to come into the state so that we can begin administering. So the site itself remains on schedule and on track. As far as South County, we're looking at the Schneider Electric location in West Kingston. Secondly, uh, Dr. Nicole Alexander-Scott, the New York Times had a somewhat alarming news story today about the coronavirus trends here uh, related to the new variants. They write the U.S. makes headway against the virus, troubling trends related to, to it persist in the Northeast. Do you share that concern? Absolutely. It's what we talked about today. It's what we've been discussing about the um, balance. The variant is here. It's been in the state and it is more contagious than the other version. So we know it's going to spread more easily and um, continue to become more predominant. But it's exactly why we continue to focus on testing, treatment, vaccination, and why I spent the additional time today talking about wearing the best mask you have access to, um, using two layers if you have a cloth mask, and wearing it effectively. Those tools, what we have leading the nation with testing, leading the nation with vaccination, and what we've shared today, making sure you get treated if you qualify, wearing your mask appropriately, will be what we need to get through uh, this time period where we know the variant is continuing uh, to spread. Governor, uh, Dr. Ja has said now is not the time to be relaxing restrictions. Why is he wrong? Oh, no, I don't think he is wrong. Dr. Ja is, in, in, uh, is on our, um, on our uh, advisory group, and we, he's, what he's saying is to make sure that we're following the protocols, make sure that we're making sure that we're staying safe. I mean, I, I had lunch with somebody who's supporting our local restaurants who's, who had to leave the table because his dad was being rushed to the hospital because of COVID. As Dr. Alexander Scott said, this is why we need to be disciplined on this issue. So I, I think if you read the, and I actually was asked that question before I came here, exact question. And uh, we read the articles, and I think you read the whole article, it'll, it'll show that what we're doing here with incremental flexibility and the way that we're gearing up for our uh, capacity is exactly what he's been telling us in our advisory meetings. And, um, and we're following a lot of his direction because we look at him as a local expert. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Ja here in Brown University. Dr. Scott and uh, Tom McCarthy, um, what, what is being said on the stage does not match reality. Last Friday at 5 o'clock, it turned out just 1% of people available were able to get a vaccination. So this talk, or an appointment, excuse me. So talk about shot in the arms and this talk of top five and strong pace. Who's responsible for that website that was malfunctioning, going down? You had people taking time out of work. It was two hours of frustration. 1% of people qualified could get an appointment. Who's in charge of that? Why not hand it over to the private sector, CVS, Walgreens, and let them handle it when it's clear the state is not up to the task? So the state is absolutely up to the task. What I described earlier is the fact that we had those few hours where we know a, a larger number of people who wanted the vaccine were attempting to log on once we have any vaccine available, we want to make it available so that it can get into the arms of individuals who were there. Yes, and we were not going to wait another week to make that available. It was important to make it available as soon as we had it, knowing, as I had said last week, that it would require patience and knowing that we would continue to get additional supply. Even through the course of this week, we have learned of the additional supply that will continue to come and we're continuing to work on improving the user experience with that as we get the additional supply we continue to make the adjustments to the technology by april 19th everyone 16 and older who want to get vaccinated will be able to get vaccinated and we are in the top five nationally with getting first doses into people's arms. So we are equipped to doing it and we'll continue to refine what as we have done. What about the phone system? Who's in charge of that? You can't even hold. I experienced it, people were telling me, I went on, they just tell you to call back later. Who's in charge of that? Are there two people handling the phone? Why doesn't it say, hold on? People have said they'll hold for two or three hours if they'll get an appointment. 
Who designed the phone system that just keeps telling you to call back later? Yep, that is of what we are working on improving as we are adjusting to these numbers. It's a part of the entire system. There is a large number of individuals who are um, man, you know, uh, overseeing the phones and responding and will continue to adjust and handling the number of cases as we need to. Why not go to a system like Massachusetts where you just register once and then the system lets you know when an appointment is available instead of having to go on every time appointments come up with a very minimal chance of actually getting an appointment. Yeah, that's what was asked earlier. That is what we are uh, developing and we'll look to have that early on um, in April prior to uh, expanding to all eligibility. Just a waiting room though, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Of the, many of the events that are planned for the summer now, whether it's a thousand people or 5,000 person events outdoors, there's some talk that they may require a vaccine certificate or something to be admitted. Are you confident that as these events are planning and spending money to make these events happen in the summer, that the system will allow for every person who wants a vaccine to be vaccinated by July 15th so that that person can be admitted to such an event and that these events can go forth and the economics will work out? Yes. Given the projections that we received yesterday from the federal government, I'm confident that by early this summer, anyone that wants a vaccine will have one in Rhode Island. Thank you, everyone. Including from the system's perspective, the back end perspective, they're confident that the system to register for a vaccine will be correct. Oh, God, that's the damn question. Question. I am. Come on. Am. Do you know the percentage of teachers that got a first dose? I do. So, very strong turnout among uh, school staff, teachers, and childcare workers. We've seen an 80% uptake. Uh, so far that have been vaccinated or are scheduled to be vaccinated in the next two weeks. Thanks, everyone.